Welcome to the fourth installment of the set of recordings covering a sample of data manipulation techniques in our studio. This recording will look at seven to eight points here of imputing for missing values and outliers. Now, just as a refresher of the data set that we actually had and we covered in the first recording, what we're focusing on here is where we have missing values and where we have outliers. So the missing values here are highlighted for um, in the yellow blank cells here of where we have a participant's weight is missing at the end of uh, the second month of the study and the triglyceride measurement is also missing at the end of the second month of the study. So I would feel when we're looking at, so the first part of this recording will be looking at the missing values. So I feel when we're looking at the missing values, it's first the case of trying to find where the missing values actually are. And then when we find them, try to impute for them. So that's the process we're going to look at here. Your other option is when you find the missing values is just to leave them as missing. So you're kind of doing a per protocol analysis. We're going to impute for them where we're going to look at the kind of an intention to treat analysis. Um, then we, the second part of this recording is where we're going to look at having an outlier. So on average, like, so we're measuring here the triglyceride levels of patients across four time points. On average, you'd expect the triglyceride level to be 150 milligrams per deciliter. Here we can clearly see that there's an outlier of 1,030. What I want to show you is how do we actually find that outlier. And then in this case, what we're going to say is the outlier is a typo. So how, how are we going to replace the outlier? Okay, so let's see. So let's go to our script that we actually have. And we'll focus so we're down here. So we're looking at the seven point here. So I, I would have said this in the previous recordings as well. I'll, I'm putting in very brief comments here. But if you subscribe to this channel, you have um, I'll upload a more detailed uh, script with um, more, more comments to kind of explain each line a line of the script as well. Okay, so you, that that can be there to download uh, if you subscribe to this channel. Okay, so first thing we're going to look at so is missing values. So what I would feel is we want to first try to locate them. So where are the missing values? What I find quite useful to use here is the complete cases function, or more so put a, an exclamation mark in front of it, and it becomes an incomplete cases. So this basically tells you where you actually have missing values. So our frame or or data frame is the diet one. So I'm going to look at complete cases, but I put an exclamation mark in front of it for a diet. And um, come here like this. And now we know we should be finding the two subjects, the two participants. And we have here where I've left out case S for cases. So that's fine. There we have it. Okay, so here we have our two participants. So we have a female that was age 49, and she's her, we'll say her um, weight at the end of the second month is missing. And then we have a male age 52 whose weight, uh, sorry, triglyceride level at the end of the second month is missing. Okay, so this line of code, the complete cases or with the exclamation mark assigned that like this will work for when you have a large volume of data. So the only reason I'm using a small volume of data is so that we clearly kind of know what answer we're looking for. So it's to generate script that will actually give us that answer. And then we can use that script in, in, for larger data frames. So we actually, what we found here is we actually have the, um, we have two missing values. And what I'm going to look at doing here is I'm just going to look to impute for this one down here. So the triglyceride levels at the second time point. Okay, so, or sorry, at the end of the second month. So I'm going to look to impute this. There's a good few imputation techniques out there. I'm going to use a very simple one of where I'm going to look at last observation carried forward. So what I'm going to look at here for this participant is take the triglyceride measurement at the end of the first month and impute it for the triglyceride measurement at the end of the second month. So 107 really essentially will come in here. Um, this, the, the, I suppose I'm keeping it quite simple for this recording. In some uh, clinical trial studies, that type of imputation technique might work. Maybe at the previous uh, time point, there might have been a different treatment given. So imputing at the latest time point from the previous wouldn't necessarily be accurate. Maybe it would be a case of getting the average of the measurements at that time point or getting, as in using the mean or using the median. So I suppose mainly there are different imputation techniques out there. I'm using the most basic one of the last observation carried forward. That doesn't necessarily apply to all studies, okay? So I suppose usually I do this in one line of code. I'm just gonna break it up into two lines and then reduce it back to one. And this is more just, I suppose, to see the building blocks to it, okay? So we're going to first look at where we're gonna focus on the diet of, so the diet being the uh, data frame of TG2. Okay, so we can see for TG2 that it's participant O. Okay, so it's participant O that is actually uh, giving us missing values. So we're going to look at the, the, the uh, measurement, the triglyceride measurement at the end of the second month for participant O. So we're going to have diet uh, 
dollar sign participant is ID. That's how we've uh, coded it equals full. Okay, so something like that. Now I'm just running this off to make sure that this is going to come back as missing. It does come back as missing, so fine. I have my kind of line of code that finds that NA. Then I'm going to just do kind of a similar line of code again, but this time I'm going to put in TG1. What I expect to get back from this is I expect to get back the 107. This is just more to check, make sure nothing's going wrong. There is the 107. So what I now want to do is I want to take that 107 and impute it for the NA. Okay, so I'm just actually going to bring this line up here. I'm going to do an, uh, an, uh, an assign essentially. And what we're doing here is we're assigning the measurement at TG1 to the blank space at TG2. Okay, so when you come up here to your diet uh, data frame, you can see that it's down as NA at the moment. So if we run off this new line of code, that should be complete. Okay, so we come back up here and we can now see for our patient though, our sub participant though, you can now see, look, there's 207. Okay, so that's quite straightforward. Okay, and again, it's more, it's a case of what I would feel is the two step process. It's first finding where the missing values are and then it's imputing. And it's a case of then having a track record of your imputation technique because ultimately you're manipulating your data. So you want to just have a track record of actually doing that. Okay. If you come back up to my line 87 there, we should only have one missing value now, which it is. Okay. And when, when you, if you, I won't impute for that here. If you did impute for this and then if you run off this line, if you run off the line 87 again, it comes back with zero. Like here, you can see here, it's telling you that you have a table one by 14, which is telling you you've one missing value. If, when you if you impute for this one this weight uh, two then this will come back as zero times 14 so you'd have zero missing values so that's kind of a, ni a nice way to just kind of check to make sure you haven't missed out on anything okay so the next thing we want to do now is to look at the outliers okay so there's loads of ways of doing this okay people have their own kind of uh, i suppose approach to uh, finding outliers what i like doing i suppose is i like actually using a box plot i like drawing the graph the box plot because the box plot is very good for symmetry it's very good to give you an idea of where you have uh, symmetry it's very good to tell you whether if whether or not there's outliers it's very good for comparisons if you're interested in comparing groups ultimately we're not interested in two of those three things we're only interested in one of them and one of them being finding outliers okay so let's i'm going to do a kind of a fancy graph so i'm going to use the gg plot okay so just make sure that the, uh, the library is loaded i didn't mean to do you like that okay so i'm going to do gg plot on diet my diet data frame where the axis my y-axis is going to be tg uh, zero i suppose the y-axis is going to be tg zero i will put something in for the x-axis but i won't for the first i will come back and just add in another, another small bit to this um, I like when I'm doing uh, box plots to actually have the whisker. It's um, the w so it's kind of a tradition. You'd be called the box and whisker plot. I like having the whiskers. You don't necessarily have to buy. It. You don't have to have them. And by default, um, SPSS won't give. Uh, sorry, not SPSS. Um, or won't give it to you unless you put in this line extra line of code bit here. Okay, so I'm explicitly asking it to put in these error bars, which are basically your whiskers. I haven't actually said anywhere yet to actually do a box plot. I, that's just kind of saying about the error bar part, which is the whisker. So I need to say GOM box plot. Yep. Here we have, and this should work out nicely. And that didn't work out nicely. Why did you not work out nicely there? Oh, sorry. Look at that. I wasn't even thinking. Uh, so TG0 is numeric because we, that's something we've checked for before. There it is. Okay. So just one thing, uh, I suppose, look. I'm just going to make this bigger. I would generally spend a bit more time, I suppose, looking at making sure to edit a graph. I mean, things that I would kind of be quite particular with is, am I happy with the scaling on the vertical axis? Am I happy with the labeling on the vertical axis? Am I happy with the scaling on the uh, horizontal axis? In this case, there actually shouldn't be any scaling really here. So what I'm just going to come back to here, just to fix that, just to tidy up a fraction of, it's not going to, still not going to be perfect, but just kind of gets rid of those numbers down on the horizontal axis. I still wouldn't like that X there. That would be something I, I would just kind of tweak a small bit by uh, tweaking the, the label to the axes. But look, that's not the purpose of this recording. It's um, I might do a recording in the future on where to look, I suppose, some recommendations on editing graphs. Um, but for the purpose of this recording, TG0, there's no outliers. Okay, So we could repeat this. Now we know that there's an outlier for TG1 because we're looking at a very small data set. We've highlighted where there's outliers or something like that and so on. So here we have an outlier. Okay, so we have an outlier for TG1, so this is something we want to address. Now, if we look at this, so like 
we actually have in total here we've 10 numeric uh, numeric um, variables okay so we should by right be checking all 10 now we know, know there's only one out there but what if you didn't know there was only one out there generally what I would actually look at doing is I would actually look at running off a series of box plots um, to run off a series of box plots and using ggplot you'd actually have to use your dplyr package and your tidyr package using the select and gather functions which is just beyond the scope of this recording we're going to touch on this um, dplyr and tidyr in the fifth uh, installment of these recordings but not in relation to I suppose uh, outputting a series of graphs uh, it could be something again I would look at at a future recording but I think so I won't go down that route, but I think at the same time, it's actually important that you do a quick scan. Uh, I suppose you generate multiple kind of box plots for your measurements. So I'm just going to use base or here just to kind of, I suppose, to highlight. I mean, it's not necessarily going to be a very fancy graph, but just a way of, I suppose, scanning your data to see whether or not you have outliers for a particular measurement. Now, we know that we only have an outlier for one, but what if we didn't know that? Okay, so I'm going to generate 10 graphs here. Okay, so if it's going to be 10 graphs, I'm going to output the graphs together in one window so that's what the windows is I'm going to output them I'm going to specify how I want to output them so I'm going to output them as a 2 by 5 okay yeah I think 2 by 5 should be fine two as in two rows five columns so that would give me 10 graphs in total and what I'm going to look at here is you now if I was to use the dplyr and uh, tidy r package I wouldn't have to do a for loop but we're do doing things in base or kind of idea here so I'm going to say in sequence so my first measurement to keep this as straightforward as possible my first measurement here is the fourth measurement and then I have 10 of them so it's going to be my fourth column all the way up to my 13th column now there's loads of ways we can be fanciful for that I suppose I just don't want to kind of make this more complicated than it needs to be so I'm going to say three sorry not three it's the fourth one up to the 13th one and we go up in steps of one and I want to generate box plot box plot of my diet data frame but each measurement within that diet data frame that should work out okay should do this here and didn't like you for some reason oh yeah sorry look at that there that shouldn't be one i it should be i my for loop goes with i and there we have it okay so i think that's quite good one thing i suppose just one thing that i wouldn't necessarily like with this is i don't necessarily know what measurements i'm looking at now i kind of have an idea and i can assume look they're going in the order that they are in the data frame but i think it'd be nice just to have our x-axis here labeled based on the measurements so i'm just going to add in a small bit extra here where i'm going to say x label label what would i say equals names of the diet measurement diet I, so that's where I'm referencing each measurement that should work out okay here and there it is okay now it's not necessarily the ovaries as pretty pretty graph like GG plot gives us gives us a lot, a lot nicer graphs but the purpose of this one here is mainly just to see are there any outliers anywhere else and clearly there's not everything else seems to be generally okay now that doesn't mean in, if this is your data that you wouldn't necessarily always just take a quick scan of the min and max values to make sure that they all make sense to you but here for the purpose of this recording we can clearly see that we have an outlier here this is what we want to address loads of ways that we can address this okay there are loads of ways of doing it i suppose the way what i'm going to look at here is where i'm going to look at look, what is the value of it okay so we know that it's 1030 but how do we get r to tell us that it's 1030 and then how do we replace that that's the way i'm going to approach this but there is multiple ways of doing this part okay so we will so if i said outlier so what we're doing here that first bit i suppose is we're just trying to locate again kind of that two-pronged approach locate and now what we'll do is we look at replacing it now the reason we're replacing it here is we're saying that that outlier was actually a typo we went back to where we actually carried out the experiment where we stored our raw data and we actually found that 1030 actually should have been 103 that's what we're kind of doing okay now obviously if you have outliers in your data it's not a case of oh outliers are always typos you fix them up but you always have to explore the presence of an outlier if it's not a typo and it's the correct reading then you might look at your doing your analysis two ways doing your analysis with the outlier left in so you're not removing the outlier and then repeating your analysis and make an informed decision to how you might actually proceed okay so how you handle outliers very it varies depending on what the experiment is what your uh, research hypothesis is and so on like that okay but here for the purpose of this recording we're going to replace it okay so if we look at here we're going to fo we know it's tg1 so we're focusing on diet of tg1 so what i'm just trying to do here is trying to find the value first okay so if we look at diet um that, and again loads of ways we could do this i'm just going to say look what values do we have for tg1 that are greater than 200 
it's going to come back with 1030 that's perfect so now we know that that value of 1030 we want to replace that with 103 that's where we're kind of making up this story so we're taking this value where this guy is going to be equal to 1030 so we're taking that value of 1030 and we're going to replace it with 103 okay now you can see when we did the um when i was referencing kind of this uh the i suppose indexing a certain part of the data frame up here i use under the inverted commas that's because we're dealing with a, a character here we're dealing with a number so you don't need under the inverted commas okay so if we just look back what we have here for the diet look we can see here in original diet frame, da, uh, data frame that it's 1030 I'm going to run off this line. So the first line here of line 102 told me the value. So then line 103, I was now aware I'm replacing that value like this. Come back up here to this. Go down to the very last participant. And we can now see that that last participant is 103. Okay. If we wanted to just, we don't necessarily have to do this. That's pretty much all I want to, really want to show. But if we wanted to, we could just run off these guys again. And now we could see there's everything seems to be quite good. Okay. So... That's kind of the, uh, I suppose, to kind of get you started off in the, uh, in the right direction, I think, when it comes to how do you handle missing values and how do you handle outliers, because they're definitely something that has to be investigated, has to be explored for, and it's a big part of data screening. So it's just important that when you're doing with RStudio, if, you're, if you are going to be replacing your raw data with uh, new values that you have a track record of doing that, that's very, very important, okay? And that's what we just try to emphasize with this. Um, that brings an end to this part, and we the last part of these recordings that will be or this I suppose set of recordings is where we're going to look at filtering and the, uh, changing your data from white to long and vice versa. So that will be looking at the dplyr package and looking at the tidyr package. Okay, so hopefully you're finding this of benefit, and you might come back for the fifth and final installment on these set of recordings. All the best.